At age three, I never got the chance to call you daddy. You taught me Musharraf. Musharraf. That was it. That was all. At age four, I never got the chance to thank you for answering my questions, millions of them, on our countless walks through the wilderness of the Bronx. <laughs> you answered ever patient with that robust laugh of yours. I can still hear it echoing in my ears. Popo, you affectionately called me as I rode your shoulders, proud and tall. I remember. At age six, I never learned how to speak Spanish. You tried to teach me your native language and it fell on deaf ears. Por favor, deme un vaso de agua. May I please have a glass of water, was all I learned to say that day on the plane ride to Panama with grandma. At age 13, I never got the chance to apologize for attempting to ignore you that day on the train with my friends. They were laughing at the man with the high water pants standing at the back of the car. And when I turned my head to laugh too, I realized it was you. At age 16, I never got the chance to properly thank you for the 106 $1 bills, neatly packaged, carefully wrapped. I couldn't comprehend how much time and love it took for you to save all that, being homeless. At age 19, I never got the chance to thank you for taking care of grandma the way you did. You loved her and protected her fiercely as I would have done had I been older. Aside from your paintings and books, you didn't own many material things, but those you loved, you protected and cherished. I should know, I was one. At age 20, I never got the chance to apologize for storming off that day we met in BK. You proposed we walk across the Brooklyn Bridge into the city. I firmly resisted not wanting to walk far in my designer shoes. You acquiesced, did what I wanted, but from that moment on, things changed. Communication became strained. At age 21, I hadn't figured out a way to repair the bridges I'd burned with you. By then, I thought I was grown and stupidly believed I had no room for you. Still young, so naive. Through your initiation, a few months later, we began to communicate again, slowly, writing letters. You overlooked my immaturity. You forgave my irrationality. You loved me. Now, at age, I realize I never got the chance to tell you how much you meant to me because I didn't see it, know it, recognize it at the time. It was only after the policeman called one day in my busy collegiate life. Do you know Julian Johnson? Julian, no, Musharraf. He spoke of your demise and recounted the facts. Found passed away on the number six train, last car, no identification except for a letter addressed to me, Kashi. As the phone slipped from my hand, I struggled to understand. I never got the chance to tell you how much you meant to me and how much I appreciated the gifts you gave so freely, like the enjoyment of a cleansing breath on a beautiful spring day, the encouragement to be an artist despite what others might say, my life, my passion, and all I aspire to be, I would be nowhere near as vibrant had you not been a part of me. And as I write, I cry. And as I speak, I yearn. Look, Musharraf, I am grown, an artist, an actress, a capable woman navigating the pathways of life, reminded of you in all that I do. This poem is for Julian Theophilus Johnson, my Musharraf. I love you.
Thank you. That was the first poem I ever wrote. Not because I wanted to, but because I had to. I wrote in a blur, my fingers furiously channeling emotions of my innermost pain through sobbing tears. And as I wrote, I remember thinking, don't stop, even if it hurts. <laughs> so I didn't. As much as I wanted to, I didn't stop. I didn't stop because I couldn't keep it in any longer. I didn't stop because I was tired of carrying this horrible weight of regret. I didn't stop because the silence was choking me. And I didn't stop because I was afraid if I did stop, I would never start again. I missed Musharraf. And 10 years after his passing, I knew I couldn't ignore him anymore. So I wrote, <laughs> as much as it hurt, in that moment I knew in order to forgive myself and to finally come to terms with the thought of my father, I had to find the courage to write that poem so I could find my voice, speak my truth, and ultimately change my life. We all have emotional scars. Some may have healed over time. You may know these as lessons learned or a definitive moment in your life. But what about the other injuries, the hidden wounds, the invisible wounds that often we try to ignore even exist? What I've learned and what I've come to share with all of you is that you have the power to change your life the moment you are brave enough to confront the parts of yourself that scare you the most. Those are the parts of you in need of the most attention, care, and love. This mantra, find your voice, speak your truth, change your life. This declaration, find your voice, speak your truth, change your life. This challenge of authenticity, find your voice, speak your truth change your life, reminded me of something. It reminded me of hip hop, real talk. See, I grew up in Queens, New York in the early 80s, and I watched hip hop emerge as a megaphone for inner city youth like me. Young black and brown voices, once silenced and relegated to the margins, were now front row center, loudly proclaiming their identities, celebrating their truths, and challenging the status quo. I saw hip hop change the world. Not only was it a culture of music, dance, and creative expression, hip hop was an art form that raised social consciousness promoted cultural awareness, and provided a path for people to protest the very real issues of poverty, drugs, and violence in their communities. It was a no-brainer then that I marry my love of hip-hop with my newfound passion for truth-telling. And the result was the creation of Act Like You Know Hip Hop Theater. This is a college theater course designed to introduce students to the legacy of hip hop while simultaneously guiding them in the creation and performance of their own original work. Students have to audition to get into this course, and not because I'm looking for the next American Idol or in search of weeding out talent, but instead because I want them to understand the rigorous demands of this course from day one. Because as they say, we don't just talk about it, we are about it. So this course can be challenging. And the process isn't always pretty. <laughs> In the first two months, I'm often met with resistance and doubt. <sighs> I understand. But just look at them and you can see. We do great work. 
In this course, students often try to leave or fight me at every turn, avoiding digging in. These are the students I live for, the ones that would rather run away or fight me instead of confronting their truths. And I understand. I mean, hey, let's be honest. Who wants to stare down their demons? But in class, we do together. I help them confront their truths about abandonment, sexual assault, domestic violence, mental illness, death, suicide, and more. And while their resistance is very real, it is no match for my persistence. <laughs> because I understand that my job is to stop them from giving up no matter what. So I constantly battle back by reminding them that what they have to say matters and the world deserves to hear it. Find your voice, speak your truth, change your life. This class culminates in a final exam that's a rite of passage, a definitive moment for students to declare who they are. They perform a live show before a very large, very enthusiastic invited audience. Terrifying? Possibly. But year after year, class after class, the only affirmation I need to affirm the fact that this is indeed truly life-changing work is to look into the faces, listen to the thank yous, bask in the smiles as I wipe away tear-strewn faces and enjoy bear hug embraces freely given student to teacher. Both forever changed by the experience. Find your voice. Speak your truth. Change your life. Whenever I teach this class, and I've done it a series of five times, I'm always reminded of that day I decided to sit down and write that poem to my father. If I didn't find my voice, I would have never opened the path of opportunity for so many others, for former students like Megan Pendleton, a then engineering student who wrote the most achingly beautiful poetry, but was so shy and soft-spoken the world might have never heard it had it not been for Act Like You Know. <laughs> Today, Megan performs her spoken word poetry for audiences large and small. Most recently, she won the opportunity to actually open for the esteemed poet, Dr. Maya Angelou. And then there's Tanise Johnson, a college athlete who had a bachelor's degree in marketing and a master's degree in sociology before we met. Upon our meeting and working together, Tanise was able to find her voice and write a life-changing poem to an alcoholic parent who is now in sobriety. Tanise continues to share her voice today as a professional actress and spoken word artist in New York City. And I can't forget Andrew Lustig. Andrew decided to take Act Like You Know because he wanted to broaden his horizons and learn more about hip hop. He did. But he also learned that his words were beautiful and deserved to be heard around the world. Today he does just that as a spoken word artist. His most recent poem, I Am Jewish, has gone viral and been viewed over a quarter of a million times. Find your voice, speak your truth, change your life. Pretty wonderful, not bad. So how do you do this? How does one find their voice? Well, you can start by trusting your impulses. We're not in the business of going with our gut 
Instead, we usually like to listen to those voices in our head. You know, the ones that belittle you and demean you or paralyze you from taking action. Fear is nothing more than letting those voices run wild if you let it. So don't let it. Next, just start. It will take practice. Write something you believe in and then be proud enough to celebrate the fact that you wrote it. Find someone to share it with and let them inspire your creativity. You must start somewhere, why not here? Next, surround yourself with people who believe in you. Let them feed your art and build your confidence. Who doesn't like a fan club? <laughs> and finally, if it doesn't stretch you, challenge you, or give you some form of discomfort, you're probably not digging deep enough. It will take work. But anything worth having, we all know, takes work. So what are the visible clues? The indicators that you are on the right path. Well, if you speak your truth and you feel vulnerable, you are on the right path. If you speak your truth and give yourself goosebumps, you are on the right path. If you speak your truth and your heart visibly pounds in your chest, you are on the right path. And if you speak your truth as you hold back tears and waves of crushing emotion, then absolutely you are on the right path. Speak truth. It's contagious. And when you do, you open up the doors to a world of experience that is unimaginable. Remember, when you speak yours, you give others the courage to stand up and speak theirs. That's as good a reason as any if you ask me. Thank you.